Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, do we like this amount of light or do we want more light? If you want more light, raise your hand. Turn on light. Let's see whether it's what this is. Okay. We'll we'll see how it goes with the vision of the board. Um, before we get started today, we're going to have a life day, right? We're going to go over some course procedures. Um, get a little bit started into the material, just so we don't get super rushed at the end as we come up to the exam, but. Hopefully everything today will be really easy, but before we get started, this is one of your new SI leaders, Hannah, so I'd like to introduce herself. <laughs> I'm Hannah. Um, I'm taking over for Al, who went to SI last semester. Um, Brooke, and she should have sent me an email, or she did, you guys should have got it, um, that SI will be on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and Thursdays so she will be there this semester. And um, they changed the policy for extra credit. I don't know what it was last semester, but I think this semester you have to come to 10 sessions to get extra credit. Um, and it's like all or nothing. So if you come to nine, you don't get extra credit. If you come to 10, then you get, I don't know how many points for extra credit it is, but you get some extra credit. <laughs> yeah. So it's going to be based on attendance um, mm -hmm. instead of, I think last semester was it that there was like a, a worksheet or a random day that was assigned as the extra credit day. Okay, so if anybody has like scheduling conflicts that make it so that they absolutely can't ever get to SI, let me know and we can talk about that because I do want it to be fair to you. But the point of having SI, right, is that you get practice. So that's the, the rationale behind this new kind of change. And so Hannah will also be sitting in on a bunch of our classes to make sure that SI stuff links up with what we're actually doing in lecture. And um, I know you guys let me know <laughs> when there are things in SI that didn't make sense because we haven't done them, but Hannah will also be able to help get us some of that feedback and make sure everything's linked up. Do you have any other words? Uh, words of wisdom? So. <laughs> Everything else is in the email. There's a lot more on like some of them will be on Zoom, but the whole email looks like if you want to follow that later at some point. Basically, this will come up in a second, but what I'm about to tell you is that a and 2 is going to run the way a and 1 did, right? <laughs> As you might have suspected, this is just a continuation of the course. So we'll be covering new systems, but structurally, nothing has changed. So we're using the same textbook. You should be able to use your same mastering a and access code. Labs are set up the same, although you do need to be side back away. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Whether you want a digital version of the textbook or not. And you had a question as 
So anatomy lab is going to be pretty much exactly the same. The difference in physiology lab is just going to be in kind of how it's structured. So the second semester physiology labs are centered around you doing research yourself. Um, so instead of doing those packets, you'll be coming up with your own research proposals and then doing them in groups and then presenting them. At least that's the way it worked in the past. If you have Dr. K, I would check with him that, that that's what he's doing because he's new to the college, so he may have his own ideas. Um, but he's good at research, so I suspect he will be doing the same thing. Um, if you're in Dr. Slate, Later's lab section, I know a specific thing that she does for this lab in the second semester. She hands you a schedule of all the assignments that are going to come with it and what you should be looking at ahead of lab in order to be prepared. And I would make sure you actually, you know, read that and probably add it to your personal calendar because occasionally things surprise people. <laughs> Specifically, there's an Excel quiz, which sometimes people don't realize is coming up, but it's on the schedule. So, so long as you I take a look at that, you should be good. Does that answer your question? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So welcome back. And to those of you who are new to this classroom, welcome for the first time. So this semester we're continuing our study of the human body. We're looking at some new systems. So when we left off in AMP1, we were talking about the heart. So shouldn't be a surprise that we're going to move into vasculature, which is your blood vessels, and the blood itself to begin with. And we'll be going through the respiratory system, the urinary system, the GI system, and we'll be finishing up with the reproductive system. So sort of to this end right now, as we start with the vasculature, uh, yeah. Uh, the slides are all linked in a link on that first uh, unit content page in uh, Brightspace, and I can send out an email if that's difficult for you to find, or if it's not giving you access, let me know. Um, but they, they should all be up there and, and accessible now. I had parts of the course accidentally set to open on the first day of class, which, which I realized might have given you trouble for today specifically. So I apologize about that. but. From here forward, it should work okay. Right, so back to the turn blood. We left off with heart. So one of the mastering A and P assignments that's up right now is an extra credit assignment, reviewing some of that chapter 13 stuff on the heart that we did to kind of jog your memories on that. Because as we start to talk about blood and how it moves around your body, it's important to remember how that pump works, right? Because everything we're going to be beginning with has to do with that pressure coming out of the pump coming out of your heart. Okay, the brief course overview. Uh, the lecture is here, so we've moved to this smaller room so I can see your faces and you can hopefully hear me better. Dr. Eder's class had to move to the giant science auditorium. Um, but we should be comfortable in here, I think. Lecture, like I ran it last semester, Hope you all come. I like seeing you. I like having people to talk to as we go through the course. Um, but if any issues crop up, uh, we do also have a Zoom session running at the same time. Um, you can also see it on YouTube. It's being live streamed, which means it's also archived. So all lectures are available after class as well for your review. After class, I try to remember to go add them to our course playlist. But if I'm ever slow on that or forget, you click on my little face, you can find some archives and their, their data. So uh, they should always be available. Always. Okay. Be doing weekly quizzes again. I've tried to <laughs> make sure that they're a little more regular and predictable this semester. So uh, just so you know how these are structured and how we write them, there are three questions for every day of lecture. And the goal is basically to have sort of two kind of basic maybe easier questions that build into a third question that kind of pulls that information together. So they're, they're related to each other as well. On the separate schedule that I've linked, and maybe I'll take you into the Brightspace course here for a second. 
just so I can point out where I'm talking about. So here we have our course. So if you go to content and you go to the syllabus page, so the syllabus is here on this link, but there's a separate schedule link because uh, mainly I made this for myself because all I really like to look at is the schedule. So on this separate schedule link, it also tells you when the quizzes are opening, aka on Fridays, they do the following Monday. This will let you know that they're open. Okay, yeah. So labs are meeting synchronously in person. So the same as last time, those labs meet in the physiology lab. Anatomy labs meet in the anatomy lab. Like last semester, there is an anatomy pre lab ahead of time. Um, you basically should be getting full credit for those. You're able to do them over and over again until you have 100% so that you're prepared for lab. And uh, I know anatomy lab can be really overwhelming. So even if they're easy, it is worth paying some attention to those uh, just to make your life a little easier once you're actually in the lab. This is just a reminder to read that physiology lab calendar if you were given a lab calendar. I've linked the overall, like what day is which lab on our announcements as well, um, in case that's hard to find in the lab. Materials are the same as last time. We have the human physiology textbook and the mastering a &T. So let's pause for a minute and have those of you who have computers click on a &T links and just make sure that that works. You've done it already or you want to do it after, then you can do it that way, but <laughs> I like to have a little trouble. In that, in that case, you might have to read the instructions just to put the PDF of like how to sign up for the first thing. So I'm going to go with that first. What this does is you know, that's the right fit for it. Upcoming things that we have happening. Nothing for next time I see you on Friday, um, but for Monday, we have the extra credit mastering a and chapter 13 assignment. So I might recommend doing that now uh, just because you've already done the material and uh, I'll give you more time to do it. We'll have that three question quiz that will open tomorrow and you'll have the weekend to do it. The mastering a and chapter 14 is due on Monday. So that'll have you take a preview at some of the things we'll be doing in this unit. Um, I'll go ahead 
and open our syllabus. Slowly scroll through it. This is just our typical course description, studying anatomy and physiology. I am your professor. Uh, my office is upstairs and a little bit that way. So on the other side of the science auditorium, number 2133. And my email address is linked here for your convenience. Uh, office hours I'm going to have for this semester are Mondays, one to two, and Fridays 10 to 11. So basically after class on Mondays, before class on Fridays. If those times don't work for you, contact me. We can we can be outside of those times. Um, those are, are just what I have blocked out in my schedule for now. Our required materials are the same. Our goals are to understand the cellular construction of major organ systems of the body. So the organ systems we just looked at thinking about major environmental requirements, circulation of body fluids, naming more anatomical features, describing organ systems, and relating physiologic processes to actual life. The uh, grading system is the same as it was for a and T1. So we're gonna have four lecture exams, a cumulative final, and you have points coming from those weekly quizzes and from your lab as well. So the breakdown of lab points is the same as last time as well. So anatomy lab is 200 points. Physiology lab is 100 points. Mastering a and assignment should add up to about 50. Weekly lecture quizzes are about 90. I think when I did the math just now, it's actually 84 points specifically. Um, and the final should be relatively low key uh, and our grading scheme remains the same as last time as well so reminder those of you who need this course for future courses as a prerequisite you're targeting a c here so you want a 72.5 or better which means that needs to be your total cumulative grade and you need to get at least that grade on one of our four lecture exams you all made it here, so I suspect you knew that. Okay. So other course policies mirror policies throughout the rest of the college. Um, so in case of major emergencies, if you can't complete the course, we do have an incomplete policy um, where we'd come up with a contract for how you finish. We expect you to exhibit academic honesty, right? So the point of you taking a and P is for you to actually know this stuff so that as you move forward, most of you are going into medical fields, right? It's bad if they're trying to explain a specific procedure to you and you don't know the basic words they're saying. So it's really important that you do your own work here. Um, we have lots of resources to help you before assignments come up, before assessments come up, use those. Equal access statement, so, um, if you need additional help of uh, you know, a different nature than, than the typical uh, sort of office hours tutoring thing, then you can visit the Equal Access Office. I work with them a lot. They're great people. They'll get you more help if you need it. Uh, confidential and required reporting. All of your professors are mandated reporters. So, um, certain things that if you come and talk to us about problems in your personal life, specifically uh, sort of sexual assault, gender-based violence problems, certain things we are required to report to like the Title IX office. Um, but there are a lot of confidential sources that we can link you up with as well, including the Jivas. I actually am one of the Jivas. Um, so I know how that system works pretty well as well. Student health services, so if you need help outside of class in this way, 
also feel free to contact me and I can get you set up. Here's a kind of strict statement on cell phones and electronic devices, which is kind of outdated, but remains in the syllabus. The only part of this that we really care about is don't take pictures of our donor bodies, right? So cell phones don't belong in the anatomy lab itself. If you did not fill out the disclosure form for the anatomy lab last time, so if you, it's been a while since you took a and one or you transferred in, something like that, um, then we'll need you to watch a short orientation video to the lab and sign a form. So let us know if that's the case. Lindsay is teaching all of the anatomy labs this time. So she's really the person to contact with anatomy lab questions. That said, I love anatomy lab and I still talk to her a lot. So if you're more comfortable coming to me, I, I'm happy to help you with that as well. Okay, our lecture schedule is also in the syllabus if you prefer to have everything all in one place. And we have this list of rights and accompanying responsibilities, which I am not going to read out loud to you, but uh, you are welcome to read. Okay, questions about the overall structure of the course? I think questions usually arise as we're actually doing the course. So just because you don't have questions now, doesn't mean you won't have them in the future and that is a okay okay so this semester as we start talking about blood and vasculature we're going to start out by talking about a bunch of physics stuff we're actually going to be talking about physics fairly regularly here uh, and i know that's not everybody's favorite and i i know a fair number of people in this class uh, have not taken physics. I think usually most of the class has not taken physics yet. You raise your hand if you have taken physics. Okay, yeah, that's what I expected. Okay, so we'll be starting from, from the bottom on those things, so the rest of you don't worry. Just some, some very basic concepts. Um, but because of that, because some people find it kind of dry, I wanted us to watch a little video about a condition related to some of these concepts that we're going to be talking about during our first unit. So as we watch the following video, we're gonna see a sort of news story about a patient talking about his experience with neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. So I'd like you to jot down or make a note of in your mind what from a and one helps you understand some of what they're talking about and what might be going on with this man's condition. And uh, think about what some additional topics that we, spoiler alert, are covering this semester would help you understand a little bit more about the reasons we use specific treatments for this condition uh, and some more reasons about why this is happening. This will hopefully help us as we're slogging through some dry material, if you ever feel like it's slogging. Obviously, I feel it's all very exciting. Um, but hopefully, if you're getting a little worn down, backing up and thinking about why this actually matters to people's lives is part of what makes this topic interesting, right? That's, that's what I try to get out of this class, although it's not always super obvious. So I've got my essay written and I've been working on it for about a week. So now I'm going to show you how I use Grammarly to edit. Okay, so here's my be skipping that. It's normal. All right. Um, guys, my way. Well, NOH, as 
he was pointed out is neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. And it's a condition that's not very common, but occurs in people who have Parkinson's disease. It's a related condition called multiple system atrophy. And the problem with ventilation is usually when we stand up, we use a chemical, a chemical called norepinephrine. And this causes the blood vessels to constrict and the heart to be faster. So blood pressure comes up and you don't feel like the blood pressure is dropping. We don't have feelings of like headedness or dizziness. Many people with Parkinson's disease, probably about one in five have symptoms in that So when they stand up, not enough norepinephrine is released and the blood pressure goes down and down. They begin to develop like headedness or dizziness and they might even pass out. So in terms of how many people are affected, it's one in five. One in five will have symptoms. These may be provoked by dehydration or not feeling well or taking medication that may lower blood pressure. So when symptoms come out, you have to pay attention to the symptoms. And one way to do this is get people check their blood pressure. They can check in in the visit when they come to our office. They can check in at home. Often after breakfast might be a time of day when it's the lowest. They can keep a diary of how it changes throughout meal time or after meals or when they're lying in bed at night. And when you find the blood pressure drops, you always look for a key uh, point, which is that the heart rate. Usually when blood pressure falls and someone feels lightheaded, the heart rate goes up and up and up. But in neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, in NOH, the heart rate doesn't change much at all. And that's really a key for a doctor and nurse to make the diagnosis. We recently spent the day with Keith, who has Parkinson's, and his wife, Linda. His diagnosis of NOH came several years into the onset of Parkinson's. Let's hear more. Do you want any more, want some more coffee? Sure. A little bit of proof? Yeah. It was 10 years after his Parkinson's diagnosis that Keith and his wife Linda noticed signs and symptoms of what would eventually be diagnosed as NOH. Episodes were sporadic. You know, kind of stumbling as after being in a car ride or going up a set of steps. Why, you know, why all of a sudden would he be busy? That was the time when we thought it was just a, just a periodic event that there was, a, was happening every now and then. And a weight diagnosis was a little bit more difficult because initially I just thought it was the other shoe that fell off the park. He had a couple falls, not just down the the steps, but a, a couple general falls, I can't just mean this is what happens with Parkinson's. And we've been educated enough that to know that everybody is different. So we were also very fortunate that our general practitioner and our movement specialist spoke to each other. So between the two of them came up with, okay, there's the second blood pressure issues here. Keith, a former pilot and self-described gym rat, has learned to manage his NOH symptoms. He makes sure to drink more water along with other lifestyle changes as recommended by his doctor. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's just patience. And sometimes you're in a situation where you don't know how severe your, your uh, episode's going to be. And uh, I, so I uh, you know, have a routine where I get up and uh, and I there's a slightest chance that uh, and the blood pressure will be equalized. And uh, I've uh, been able to avoid any uh, any attacks as far as the control, you know, medical. They keep a blood pressure log and communicate regularly with their healthcare team. Communication with your doctor is extremely important. College sweethearts, the halls have always been an on-the-go family. They're taking steps to help ensure they continue to stay active, even with Keith's Parkinson's and NOH. When Keith's first initial diagnosis, to me, it wasn't devastating. I'm always taken aback when people say that. So to us, it was just part of what our journey was going to be. It might be tiring, but I think to have things move smoothly, and, and you do have to think about everything. So if you are traveling or you're going out, you make sure that you, you know, have your snacks and your water and your glasses. And <laughs> it's just part of who we are and what we're doing. And they're committed to spreading awareness. I think the best thing is, is to look into lo what your local resources are. Support groups, 
can be wonderful, but they also cannot be for everyone. Finding classes that you can either do together or finding your own thing that you can do. Now, Doctor, while you're not Kate's physician, can you relate this to how your experience has been with your patients? Well, I think what we heard from Susan is right. Uh, that these symptoms come on very gradually. It's hard to sometimes recognize that they need symptoms. We've had symptoms of Parkinson's for several years, and we've had trouble maybe arising from the chair and walking and having good balance and movement. And now different symptoms may occur that can be confused with the mobility problems of Parkinson's. So it's important when you have any types of symptoms, standing or after a meal, to bring those up at a visit with the doctor and nurse and talk about how the symptoms may be different and may be early symptoms of allergies. Now, doctor, once properly diagnosed, are there ways to manage NOH symptoms? When they stand up, they can do it gradually. Sit at the side of the bed for a couple of minutes. Then stand up and before they walk, wait a couple of minutes. Sometimes squeezing the calf muscles or the glute muscles can help maintain blood pressure when they stand up as well. Some of our patients wear compression stockings. It's usually up to the weight, so it can really push the blood back from the stomach and also the legs. We tell our patients to remain well hydrated. To really concentrate on drinking a lot of water and other fluids and any salt in the diet, especially thinking of fluids in the morning hours, blood pressure is lower. So our patients elevate the head of the bed when they sleep. When they don't work, we have medications that can help as well. Our patients always have to talk with their doctors and nurses to make sure that whatever they're anticipating to do to try to treat this problem is done with medical guidance. Sister, manageable, and that you can modify the uh, the uh, response that you had that you uh, have to uh, the NOH advising patient, you can live with it and you can you can do well with it. So, doctor, to summarize everything, what are the key things we need to remember here? Well, I think it's important to realize that it's NOH is very common in Parkinson's. It's even more common in multiple system atrophy. And so, whenever you have symptoms that occur when you stand up, always think that it could be a symptom of NOH and bring it up at the next visit with your doctor and nurse, and to make the diagnosis, the blood pressure has to be checked, seen, and also standing with the heart rate to make that diagnosis. But the diagnosis has to be made so we can use effective management to try to improve the symptoms and not have people doing less and less activity, becoming isolated, becoming depressed, not going out and going about their day because the blood pressure is too low. Well. Doctor, thank you so much for your time and all the information you've given us today. Okay, thank you. And if you'd like more information on NOH, you can go to this website, nohmatters.com, or just check out our website, thedominiac.com. Okay, so I'm going to flip us back to some of these questions. So we'll figure out how to have a class discussion briefly in a room like this. Um, what are some A and P1 concepts that you might have thought a little bit about as, as we were thinking about this condition? Anybody notice anything that seems familiar? Mm -hmm, yeah, we have some central nervous system in there. What else? Anything else seem familiar? We talked about What do you think we're going to be talking about next? Is this related to this? What do you think? That's going to help us understand this a bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's partially linked to that norepinephrine and, and the heart. But we'll think a bit more about the heart. Mm -hmm. Yep, that is our very first topic, right? So pressure. 
gradient and pressure overall, right? We're gonna be talking about blood pressure a lot because this is one of the things that we can control through a number of different mechanisms in the body. So uh, homeostatic control of blood pressure and blood volume. Okay. Anybody have any guesses about why some of those treatments might help with this condition? Um, you don't have to look back at the list. And I'm not actually looking for a right or a specific answer here. Anybody have any thoughts? So maybe some of them change the, the release of the norepinephrine. I think the salt is actually about something else. So I'm going to tell you my guess. When we get to the renal system, we're going to see how salt content um, is really linked to blood volume and how, how much fluid gets filtered out of the blood. So I think that that salt comment is actually about that, about the relationship between blood volume and blood pressure. Uh, I was in the hospital yeah like does anybody ever feel like they get like puffy or swollen if you eat something really salty i think i think it's it's kind of working with that yeah so it's actually going to link up to several of the systems that we're going to talk about uh, that said at the end there, I think they told you to, to worry if you have any of these symptoms when you stand up. I, <laughs> I don't think most of you have Parkinson's. <laughs> um, there, there are other reasons for, for having issues um, with blood pressure, with dizziness as you stand up. There's a much more normal um, kind of thing that happens that as you stand up, an initial thing that happens is blood sort of cools because of gravity. So it, it is not uncommon for people with lower blood pressure to, to sort of feel a little woozy or uh, I don't know, sometimes I see stars and my vision goes gray if I stand up, but um, we have a lot of corrective mechanisms that correct that really quickly. So part of his problem was that those corrective mechanisms uh, don't kick in in the same way because of this condition. So. Don't, don't freak out if you feel dizzy when you stand up. <laughs> that, that part we're not gonna keep. <laughs> so we're gonna, none of, none of that is going to be stuff that I'm going to be testing you on per se. That's just kind of contextualizing what we're gonna talk about. But I do wanna start the very first couple of slides on our physics section. The reason for this is that our second concept that we talk about here can be a little trickier to understand. So we're going to start with the kind of easier thing. So we're thinking first about what pushes blood through the vasculature and what can slow it down. That's, that's our basic question for this first part of class. We're thinking about super basic physics stuff. So thinking about as we go through here, we're going to be thinking about what physical parameters, so what properties of blood vessels, so vasculature is blood vessels, what physical properties vary that are going to change how our blood moves through them. So a fundamental thing that we're going to need to learn first before we think about any specific part of our vasculature, of the cardiovascular system, is we're gonna to need to think about pressure gradients. We thought about a fair bit as we were talking about the heart, right? We were relating changes in pressure to movement of the blood through the heart, the valves. So that's kind of coming back now, but now we're going to be thinking about pressure differences for kind of a longer distance. We're gonna be thinking about pressure differences across the whole system. And we're going to talk about resistance. So this is the topic that I want us to spend a lot of time thinking about critically on Friday, where we're going to talk about pressure today. Okay. So resistance is a way we're going to control the speed of blood flow. It's going to be our primary way that we can control what's going on. 
So we'll be relating together differences in pressure and resistance as both of these play a role in overall blood pressure and therefore in how blood is circulating. So starting with a possibly familiar picture, I want you to pretend you are this little boy staring up at the hose. What might happen next if you had to predict? Uh huh. What's what's gonna happen to 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 you slash this little boy if the hose gets turned on? <laughs> Why is that? Yeah, yeah. A bunch of water is gonna come through. It's gonna spray you in the face, right? Not great. <laughs> um, I mean, or great. Maybe only a little bit come through and you'll spray, right? So why would why would that? B. So what what's happening here, right? So when we're looking at the end of this hose, right? Right now we can see that there's no liquid coming off out. If we turn on the spigot that this hose is attached to, why would we suddenly expect there to be water? Where's that force coming from? Mm -hmm. Yeah, potential energy, and from that pressure that's coming out, that fluid coming out of the hose, coming out of the wall. So in the system, we would have um, pressure at the opposite end, and right here we don't have any water, so this might be lower pressure. That's what we're we're kind of adjusting as we turn up that faucet. In this case, this is an even more dangerous situation because this could happen at any moment. Now, where would you say there's a lot of high pressure or low pressure in this situation? Yeah, it's all building up at that kink there, right? So pressure makes a difference in real life, right? We can even think of that kink uh, when we get to the concept of resistance. We, we might think about that as kind of like a, a form of resistance, depending on how tightly we've squeezed that uh, hose closed. Okay. So when we're thinking about blood and when we're thinking about blood flow, we want to remember that the circulatory system is a closed loop. So the blood flow is going all the way around. We do have some filtering happening at the, at the kidney, but, but we're not thinking about that until later. It's not going to substantially change the amount of blood in the system. It's really just keeping the same amount of blood in the system. So the blood is going to flow the same as a liquid in a tube. The pressure is going to be the force exerted by the blood. So we're going to have a lot of pressure coming out of the heart. And we talked a little bit about how pressure gets stored in the aorta, right? We looked at the aortic arch, that pressure getting stored in the walls as it expands, holds pressure so that we can have constant blood flow throughout the cardiac cycle. We'll be thinking about that pressure as we think about the blood circulator. Okay, so our rule that we want to remember here, all right, this is a property of the universe. The blood flow is going to occur from high pressure to low pressure. Right? So just like other gradients, we're going from regions of high pressure to regions of low pressure. And this is still true for our cardiovascular system, even though we're thinking about a bigger physical loop. Now, there are a number of factors that can resist that flow and that can slow down the flow of the fluid. The one we are going to be paying attention to that is variable within the circulatory system is something called resistive. So when we see this letter R as standing for resistance, um, I like to think of resistance almost as kind of like friction, right? Well, I'll make that relationship as we talk about resistance, but we'll focus on resistance on Friday. So we're going to see this equation a lot as we talk about the cardiovascular system, that the flow, and sometimes we'll call it bulk flow, right? So flow or bulk flow, I'll add the word bulk, is equivalent to the difference in pressure across the system, right? So the pressure gradient divided by the amount of resistance. Difference, pressure, 
over our resistance. So when we're thinking about these pressure gradients, we're going to be measuring between two places to figure out how, how big that difference in pressure is. And that's going to affect our flow rate. Right? It's actually going to be directly proportional to how much flow we have. Okay, so our heart is going to be really responsible for the creation of this pressure gradient. Not the only thing that plays into this calculation, but but it's the main factor here, right? Because the heart is creating that pressure at the beginning of our loop, creating that pressure in the aorta as we pump blood out. A gradient has to exist for blood to flow through the circulatory system. If you were to have the same amount of pressure leaving the heart and coming back into the heart, the blood would not move. So we, we always have a pressure gradient um, in order to move blood. So we can look at some of these pictures here. Actually, let's look at them all together. Okay. So we have three situations here illustrating some of the things that can happen here, some of these general principles. So let's actually start with image B. So image B here. What's the flow? What's the flow of our fluid? What? Yep. Why is it zero? Exactly. So our pressure difference is zero, right? So if we were to try to use our equation, right, our flow, I'll just put an F for now, equal to the difference in pressure divided by the resistance, okay, which means we're dividing zero by some number. Doesn't matter what that number is, right? If we divide zero by a number, we are not suddenly going to get a value, right? Our flow here is gonna be zero because there's no pressure difference. So now we're gonna compare A and C. So compare the flow rates between A and C. What do you notice about the flow for A and for C? Are they the same or are they different? Raise your hand if they're the same. Great, they are the same, yes. Yeah. So we have the same flow for A and for C. But if we look at the pictures, what's different in those pictures? Yeah, so what we will notice, right? They didn't just put two copies of the same picture. They showed us columns that are of different heights, right? So like this column, uh, another color, right? So this column, is 100 millimeters of mercury. This column is 200 millimeters of mercury, but we have the same flow rate. So how, why? Why did this not make a difference that we changed the pressure, that initial pressure in the system? Exactly. So the reason we have the same flow rate in situations A and B is because we don't care about the absolute pressure in either of these situations, right? We don't care that this is 200. We don't care that this is 100. What we care about is the difference between the ends of our system, right? So even though this column in C is higher than that column in A, that's okay. We're ending up with the same difference because the opposite end of our system is also higher and our pressure difference in both of these diagrams is the same. So that's how we're ending up with the same flow rate. Okay, any questions? Does this make, make sense so far? 
Awesome. So this is going to be the basis of what we'll talk about next time. So this is the pressure part. Next time we'll talk about the resistance part, and then we'll start applying it to blood vessels.